you come to that program with your members, you will never regret coming. And the Lord will move in a tremendous way. God is using Baba for the end time, and we have to support his ministry and support the work of God together. And there will be impartation in the life of ministers. There will be ministers conference during this program. The program is dated for July 28th to 2nd August. And it's going to be a wonderful time in the presence of the Lord. If you are not there, you are not anywhere. Come with your members, come with ministers of the Lord, and let us learn at Jesus' feet. And God will continue to use our back for His glory. We'll continue to use you and myself for the glory of the kingdom. And I pray on the last day, eternity will not elude any of us in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Come and be blessed. Build total emancipation by the authority of Christ. The inspirational and international evangelist, Pastor Dr. W. F. Kumui, will be ministering along with Jeff Dio, our guest music minister. Coming to you live from Ikorodu, Lagos State, Southwest Nigeria. And broadcast to the world via satellite, social media, radio, and television. We are inviting the entire populace in and around Lagos. PFL Lagos is fully involved. And our men and women and youth have been charged, have been given the marching order to ensure that this thing is a huge success. We are praying, we are believing, we are putting the network and our resources into it. And we trust at the end of it all, millions of souls will be gladly brought into the kingdom of God. GCK in the seventh month, globally packaged to perfect total emancipation by the authority of Jesus Christ. Get ready for total freedom this july i'm going to grab you by the hand drag you out of the valley and i'm going to drag you to the mountain top the global crusade with kumui gck authority is coming Christ, it says we are to baptize them in water. After that baptism, we continue to teach them all things whatsoever the Lord has commanded us. Number one, you evangelize them. After evangelizing them, you don't leave them there on the field. You they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, enlighten them. That means educate them. There's still something that follows when you are giving your life to the Lord. You need to be baptized in water. Why? Because it's a commandment of the Lord. You baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Number three is to encourage them to endure. Encourage them to endure. You see, in those olden days, whenever they were baptized in water, you understood, it's a public identification for the body of Christ. It's a public identification with Christ himself. And of course, the unbelieving people are going to see that. And as a result of that, persecution may come. Because that public identification with the Lord Jesus Christ and with the body of believers will expose them to the public knowing. Now they are believed on the Lord. And persecution may come. That's why you have number three. You encourage them to endure. And you remind them the words of Jesus Christ. He that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. Now they are to be integrated into the church. How do you integrate into the church? Number four, enlist them, enroll them. Enlist them, enroll them. It's like, you know, a child has gone to school and the name enters the register. And now we know that this child belongs to this class. And every time the teacher comes there to that class, he expects to find this boy. He expects to find this girl. That's why he'll bring out the register. And he wants to see all these young people that are enrolled in the school and enrolled in the class. He has enlisted them. He has listed them out. And then before he starts anything, he says, Mary, yes, ma'am. John, yes, madam. And Joseph, yes, I'm here. He calls the role. And that's what the Lord is telling us to do. We've gone out to evangelize them. And then we enlighten them, we educate them. We encourage them to endure. Now they must become part of the church. And becoming part of the church means enrollment. And it means we're enlisting them as part of the people of God. Number five now, exemplify your exhortation. You're exhorting them. 
you are instructing and you are telling them, here is the way a child of God behaves. Here is the way a child of God will live. Here is how we maintain a relationship with the Lord, relationship with one another, integration relationship with the church. You exemplify what you are exhorting them to do, what you are exhorting them to practice, what you are telling them. And then number six, edify them. Every time you go to follow up, you are visiting them. You ask yourself, what does this new convert need? What does this new convert need to bring him up, lift him up, and help him to stand on his two feet on this new faith? And because you are thinking of that, what am I going to do? What am I going to say that will make a positive impact in his life? You are talking about edification. What can I teach? How can I instruct? And how can I present everything it will bring for the edification? Number seven, engage them. Engage them. They need to get involved. That's how we ourselves were brought up. That's how we ourselves were lifted up. And then we were able to do, we're now able to do what we're doing today. Acts 15, verse 36. And some days after, Paul said unto Barnabas, let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do and see how they are going on with the Lord. That's what we call visitation and follow-up. And it's a ministry. Everyone that has the ministry of evangelism must also have the ministry of this visitation and follow-up. In Romans chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 9. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. Stop there for a moment. Don't turn too fast. Now you see, when we're doing follow-up, we pray. You preach, yes, but you pray. You pray for the people before you go to preach to them. You reach and touch the throne of heaven on their behalf before you go to them and actually reach and touch them. You see, it is a prayer that will prepare your heart and the prayer that will prepare their heart and then link you together in that follow-up exercise. What's the result of such a thing? Number one, it will give us strong, steadfast believers. If you follow up and you do not leave the people, just to find their own way or to find their feet. When you follow up on those new converts, it will make them strong, make them steadfast believers. Number two, it will give us steady growth of those converts. Those converts will be growing steadily, and they will be growing up in the things of the Lord. Number three, it will also bring fervent commitment to evangelism in the local church. Number four, it will also mean the prevention of backsliding. That's how they did it in the early church, and that's what the Lord is calling us to do. We ought to do it as well. This is our own time, and these new converts are there, and we're going to follow up on them. You make a vow before the Lord in Psalm 76, verse 11. Vow and pay unto the Lord your God. Let all that be round about him bring presents unto him that ought to be feared. Bring presents. The present you are bringing now is this soul. You have the card. You have the name. You have the contact address. He has given himself to the Lord. And you want to present him on the final day before the Lord. And the vow you are making is this new convert that has not come to know the Lord, either through me or through you or through our brother there, through our sister there, or through the crusade or through our soul winning evangelistic outreach in our district or, or zone. Now you have the contact and you are the one to do the follow-up. And you want to present this soul eventually unto the Lord as uh, a person that you want to the Lord, we want to the Lord, and we're keeping in the Lord. I pray you will keep them. And they will not be lost. And on the final day, according to our consecration, commitment, and vow, they'll be with the Lord and be with us together in Jesus' name. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. Pray together. We want to Father, we thank you for the Bible study tonight. Thank you for your truth. Thank you for the gospel. And thank you for the call you're giving us to come into the faith and to abide in the faith. 
We pray that the grace to abide with Christ in Christ until glory you give to everyone in Jesus name we are asking Lord that once again you open the spiritual eyes of everyone that will behold the truth that you have reserved for us in your word in Jesus name thank you Lord because we know you have answered in Jesus name we pray God bless you. You can sit down. We're coming to Galatians chapter 3. We've been studying from chapter 1, and now we're in verse 13. Galatians chapter 3, reading from verse 13. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Be made a curse for us, for it is written, cause it be is everyone that hangeth on a tree in verse 14 that the blessing of abraham might come on the gentiles through jesus christ that we might receive the promise of the spirit through faith those two verses introduce us to what we're looking at tonight as we look at the bible we have different dispensations and different eras from genesis to exodus chapter 2 you have the era or the period of the conscience they lived by their conscience the law had not been written the law had not been given to them, but the Lord implanted in their hearts, in their conscience, what is right to be done. And then from Exodus chapter 2, when Moses was born, until the end of the Old Testament, you have the era of the law, and the law was given to them. The Ten Commandments were written, on the tables of stone but then the other laws like ceremonial laws and social laws and their relationship with each other based on the reaching law given to them everything was spelled out there was nothing left for guessing or for imagination this do and thou shalt live this if you don't do then you will die the soul that seen it it shall die and then christ came and when he came he brought not the law of moses he actually came to fulfill the law of moses and after fulfilling that law he now brings us into the kingdom by faith and that gives us the gospel gives us the grace of God and grace and faith work godliness in our lives and so it is no more the law but faith and faith deals with the promises of God but the children of Israel did not know did not understand when to come out of the law and to come into the promises of God by faith that the reason they had much, much problem with the Lord Jesus Christ when he came. They were always looking back to the law, and Christ was bringing them to faith. It was telling them that now a new era, a new period, a new dispensation, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Behold the Lamb of God no more the lamb on the altars of the jewish sacrifice behold the lamb of god who takes away the sin of the world and then jesus the messiah jesus the righteous jesus the redeemer came that he not the lamb not the animal that he christ is the one to save us from sin and the promise is whosoever 
shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved and where to come with that promise for the promises unto you and to your children and to them that are far off even as many as the Lord our God shall call by believing the promise of God by having faith in the provision of God we come into the kingdom and we come to Christ and that is what transforms our lives that whosoever be in Christ is a new creature old things pass away all things become new character becomes new lifestyle becomes new and the disposition we have everything becomes new because not because we are in Genesis the time of conscience not because we are in Exodus chapter 20 all through to Malachi the time of the Lord but because we are now in the dispensation of grace and the grace of God works in our lives and we are now told it is as we have that faith in the promise of the Lord we come to the blessing of Abraham that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles not only Jews who are the law but on the Gentiles and then it says through Jesus Christ that we might receive the promise the promise of the Spirit through faith faith in Christ that's why tonight we're looking at this passage in Galatians chapter 3 verses 13 to 29 I was looking at the superiority of the promise of faith the superiority now when you say superiority you are comparing two things that this one is higher than the other the superiority of the promise of faith above beyond the law of Moses three things we're looking at in the passage number one the promise of the Spirit through faith the promise of the Spirit there's no restriction here to the Jews or to the Gentiles the Spirit of God coming to everyone alerting everyone teaching everyone bringing everyone out of what is past and bringing us to the very presence of God and we have the promise of the Spirit and we claim the promise by faith number two the prophecy on the siege and its fulfillment that the Lord had given the promise unto the seed singular not unto seeds as to the uh, different children in different generations of Abraham but unto the seed and that seed is Christ and then we have the fulfillment as Christ has come number three is the purpose of the schoolmaster in focus let's come to number one number one the promise of the spirit through faith we're coming to those two verses again Galatians chapter 3 reading from verse 13 Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law he has done it already when he went to the cross and when he died for us on the cross and when he said it is finished he has redeemed us from the curse of the law he has redeemed us from the condemnation of the law he has redeemed us from all the consequences of the broken law christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us for it is written cause said is everyone that hangeth on a tree and what did he do that for us verse 14 again it says that the blessing of abraham might come the blessing of abraham might come on the gentiles through jesus christ that we might receive the promise of the spirit through faith 
three things we're looking at number one the promise of salvation through faith in Christ that we might receive the promise what promise the promise of salvation number two the possession of sanctification through faith and consecration the Lord himself made provision for everything number one for our salvation number two for our sanctification through faith the faith we have in him when we come to him and lay everything upon the altar and consecration number three the power of the spirit for fruitfulness in his commission all that we have in the promise of the spirit salvation promise in the of the spirit sanctification through faith and consecration and power the power of the holy ghost the power of the spirit for fruitfulness in the commission let's look at number one number one is the promise of salvation through faith in christ look at romans chapter 10 reading from verse 8 in romans chapter 10 verse 8 but what says it the word is nice thee even in thine mouth and in thine heart that is the word of faith which we preach for anyone to have salvation we must hear of christ as savior we must know the promise of christ our savior we must know how the process how to come into that salvation there are preachers who preach salvation but they'll spend 90 percent of the time talking about the law talking about sin talking about the evil in the world and then they spend maybe about five minutes and talk about faith that's not a good proportion we're talking about christ we're talking about faith we talk about the process by which the people come to the lord but if we preach sin 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 condemnation and guilt and the condemnation and the damnation and we spend all the time and then in passing we just say okay christ can save you come to the lord now that's not the that's not how to pre present salvation what says he the word is near thee even in thy mouth and in thine heart that is the word of faith we need to make the sinners know that salvation is available now and that whosoever shall call on the name of the lord shall be saved we need to make them understand even if their tears were flowing even if they're rolling on the ground even if they felt sorry for their sin all that is not enough the word of faith which were preached look at verse 9 in verse 9 that if thou shall confess with thy mouth the lord jesus now a sinner may confess sin every day of the year and confess and confess and come back again i remember another one confess and for confess that's not what the scripture is saying the scripture is saying if you confess christ as savior as redeemer as the messiah if you confess christ as the one that links you up with the heavenly father he's a redeemer he's done the work already that he that shall confess with thy mouth the lord jesus and shall believe in thine heart that god has raised him from the dead thou shalt be saved you see the mistakes of many they confess sin they don't confess christ the savior the redeemer 
the one who has died for us, they have conviction about their sin, about their guilt, about their condemnation. They do not have conviction about the Christ who died and about the Christ who was nailed to the cross and who took away all our sin. Look at verse 10. In verse 10 it says, For what the heart man believeth unto righteousness, not by struggling, not by trying, not by turning over a new leaf the way have righteousness, but with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And look at that in verse 13 now. Verse 13 says, For whosoever, whosoever, those who have been deep in sin, high in sin, those who have gone far in sin, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You know, there are some people that even wonder, all these crusades we are having, and then we say you want to receive the Lord as your personal Savior, stand up there and raise up your hand, and then we say come to Christ, and they don't cry. They don't roll on the ground. They don't feel sorry. They don't bring the remembrance of all the sins they committed from when they were very young until this time. They just stand up there and they say, yes, Lord, I give you my heart and I confess that now you are my Savior. And then the preacher assures them, you have called upon the name of the Lord. You are saved. You are born again because whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord Lord shall be saved. And some people say, uh, is that salvation? Can people get saved like that? Thank God for the testimonies we are hearing. The people that their lives have been transformed and righteousness came into their lives because they confess Christ is now my Savior. He died for me on the cross of Calvary. I have the joy of salvation. I have the victory in salvation. I have called, and the word says, and I believe it, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let's come to First Peter chapter 1, verse 5. Who are kept by the power of God? We're saved, and in that salvation, we're kept by the power of God. And God has enough power to keep everyone that has genuinely come to the Lord. And we don't have to doubt, can this stand? Is it of any value? All these uh, things we're doing, uh, we're evangelizing, we're going out, and they say they have believed. Is it of any value? Of course, yes. Are they kept? Yes. Who keeps them? God. Kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. I pray that as we faithfully present the word of God, the people will receive, receive Christ, believe Christ, they'll be saved in Jesus' name. Look at number two here. Number two, the possession of sanctification through faith and consecration. It tells us in Ephesians chapter 5, uh, reading from verse 25. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. The church is the ecclesia. The church, the people that are called out of sin, called out of society, called out of evil, called out of the world, of wickedness that's the church because they were called and they came out and they believed of the lord jesus christ they are the church now christ gave himself for the church why verse 20 says that he might sanctify and cleanse it that he might sanctify and cleanse it some people have little understanding about that word sanctify and so god brings the next word to tell us what he means cleanse he sanctifies 
he cleanses. Some people say to be sanctified is only to be set apart. It's only to be removed from there to here. The salvation already, when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you are part of the ecclesia. You are part of the church that is called out, set apart. But the sanctification that Christ preached about after the disciples had been saved, and assured them their names were written in heaven. He now prayed and he said, Father, sanctify them, cleanse them, purge them, purify them, make them holy, that he might sanctify and cleanse it. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Sanctification is inward cleansing. The cleansing of the heart, the cleansing of the spirit, the cleansing of our mind, the cleansing of our thoughts that inwardly and outwardly, outwardly saved. All the external sins are taken away. Inwardly, in our heart, in our spirit, in our soul, we are now sanctified and cleansed. It says that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Look at verse 26, 27, the consequence of that sanctification. It says that he might present each the church unto himself, a glorious church, not having spot. That's what the sanctifying and the cleansing will do not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that it should be holy that's what sanctify and cleanse it by the washing of water by the word that's what it does that it should be holy and without blemish first thessalonians chapter 5 reading from verse 22 First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 22. Abstain from all appearance of evil. That's salvation. That now you are born again, you are saved. You don't have any interest in evil anymore. You don't have, have any attraction to evil anymore. The evil of the world and the evil of the carnal nature does not attract you, interest you anymore. There is no magnetic field, magnetic current between you and evil anymore. Abstain from all appearance of evil. That's salvation. After that, verse 23. In verse 23, and the very God of peace, the God of peace who had given you peace at salvation, the God of peace who had taken away the condemnation and the guilt and the confusion and the fear of eternal judgment that God of peace now sanctify you wholly and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless until unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ verse 24 he will do it. I said he will do it. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. Hebrews chapter 13, reading from verse 12. Hebrews 13 verse 12, wherefore Jesus also that he might sanctify the people. Jesus also also is savior he saved us but then uh, that is not the end also that he might sanctify the people with his own blood the same blood that forgave us that changed us that redeemed us 
the same blood that is shed on the cross of Calvary that saved us. That same blood is the blood that sanctifies us. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate, outside the gate. Look at verse 13. It says, let us go forth, therefore, for that sanctification to be ours, although he has shed his blood, we have to go forth unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. Verse 14 says, For here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. Acts chapter 15 verse 9 and he put no difference between us and them between us Jews and them Gentiles God put no difference between us and them purifying their hearts by faith purifying their hearts by faith that's how we get sanctification that's how we get the purifying of the heart by faith. Let's look at number three here. Number three is the power of the Spirit for fruitfulness in His commission. It tells us in Luke chapter 24, verse 49, And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. Remember, remember that the promise of the Spirit it's what we receive as we come to the Lord. Salvation, sanctification, and the power, immersion, baptism in the Holy Spirit. And Jesus said, I set the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry him in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endured with power from on high. Tarry tarry in prayer tarry in consecration tarry in obedience to the lord tarry in making sure that there is no barrier between you and the fulfillment of the promise of god and you tarry in prayer you tarry by faith you tarry in total dependence on god until ye be endued with power from on high. Acts chapter 1, reading from verse 4. I've been assembled together with them. He commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which said he, ye have heard of me. Verse 5, here is the promise of the Father. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Verse 8, for ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Those who are going to witness in Jerusalem must have the power of the Holy Ghost. Those who are going to get to Judea and minister in power must have the power, the immersion, the baptism in the Holy Ghost. Those who are going to get to Samaria and they're going to witness effectively, they must have the power of the Holy Ghost. And those who are going to get to the uttermost part of the earth, to the edge of the world, and to the people that live in the last hours of the last days of the dispensation, we must have the power of the Holy Ghost. That's why it says we shall receive power after, not before. 
we shall receive power when the Holy Ghost comes upon us and then we're witnesses unto the uttermost part of the earth in Acts of the Apostles chapter 5 I'm reading from verse 32 Acts chapter 5 verse 32 and we are his witnesses of these things so also is the Holy Ghost whom God has given to them that obey him. The Holy Ghost given to the believers who are saved, who are sanctified, and they obey the Lord in waiting, waiting for the Lord. The Holy Ghost whom God has given to them that obey him Romans chapter 15 we're reading from verse 19 Romans chapter 15 verse 19 through mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God that's what we receive when we're baptized in the Holy Ghost immersed in the Holy Ghost so that from Jerusalem and round about unto Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. We preach in the power of the Spirit. We are saved, we are sanctified, we are baptized in the Holy Ghost, and we go in that power, reaching out to the world in the power of the Holy Ghost with the gospel of Christ. We'll come to point number two now. Point number two, the prophecy on the siege and its fulfillment. We're coming to Galatians chapter 3 and we're reading from verse 15. Brethren, I speak out of the manner of men. Though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. Verse 16. In verse 16, it says, Now to Abraham and the seed, what the promise is made, he saith not to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed which is Christ. Then in verse 17, it says, And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, 430 years later, cannot disannul, cannot cancel, that it should make the promise of none effect. Then in verse 18, For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more a promise. The inheritance we have, the heritage we have, the promise we have, the provision we have, if it be of the law, then it cannot be by promise, but God gave thee to Abraham by promise. Then in verse 19, it says, Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgression. Till the siege, that's Christ, till the siege, till Christ shall come, to whom the promise was made. I was ordained by angels in the hand of the mediator. In verse 20, now, a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Verse 21, is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could give, would have given life, eternal life, very righteousness 
should have been by the Lord. Then in verse 22, it says, But the scripture has concluded all under sin. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The scripture has concluded all under sin that the promise by faith, the promise by faith, the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them, them, Jew or Gentile, them, everyone in the world, might be given to them that believe. That's the prophecy concerning the seed. And the Lord had prophesied that 430 years before the coming of the Lord, before the coming of the Lord Moses, it was promised that it is through that seed that redemption will come, that blessing will come, that the benefits that God had promised will come on the whole of humanity. It is through the promise I will receive the fulfillment by faith, not by the law of Moses, the prophecy on the seed and its fulfillment. Three things we're looking at. Number one, the identity of the seed, Christ. The identity of the seed, Christ. Number two, the inheritance through the seed, the confirmation. When Christ came, then the confirmation came. Number three, the interruption before the seed. The interruption before the seed. Before the seed will come. Before the conversion will come. Before the new life will come. Before Christ will enter in our lives. There will be conviction that I need him. Conviction. All I am, all I do, all I struggle for cannot achieve salvation. There will be conviction that it is only him and him alone that can give me that salvation and that redemption. There will be conviction. The interruption before the siege, conviction. Let's look at number one. Number one, the identity of the siege. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 16. Now, to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He says not to seeds as of many, but as of one. And to thy seed, which is Christ. Would you know? That when God was talking to Abraham back in Genesis, and he said, through thy seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Through thy seed, all the families of the earth will be saved. Through thy seed, all the families of the earth will have the blessing of redemption. He was talking about Christ. Look at Genesis chapter 22, verse 18. And in thy seed, singular, shall all the nations of the earth be blessed in thy seed. The Holy Spirit, now through Paul the Apostle, tells us that seed is not Isaac. It's not Jacob, it's not the 12 patriarchs, it's Christ. That's the identity of the seed. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. Acts chapter 3, reading from verse 25. Acts chapter 3. Verse 25, ye, ye are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, 